And that's absolutely fantastic, Luke. Thanks a million for that um, wonderful introduction. It's actually, sometimes it's funny to hear that out loud, spoken back to you that I'm a PhD candidate. Who would have thought that a few years ago? So um, I'm delighted to be here today, guys, and thanks a million to the Centre for Engaged Research for um, giving me this opportunity to, to speak about this topic. I suppose I'll give you a little bit of background on myself and why I find it so uh, amusing to hear that term, PhD candidate. I wasn't always involved in academia. In fact, I worked in construction for 27 years and then decided to come back um, to education as a mature student. I completed my undergraduate degree in psychology in the School of Psychology in Dublin City University. And my research, my final year project or my research thesis in fourth year was looking at the area of young onset dementia and sort of set me on a path to, to pursue that topic um, as part of my PhD. So I'm delighted you can, everybody could join us here today from my kitchen in County Mead. I want to apologise in advance if you hear loud snoring coming from the background. It's not me, it's the dog who is fast asleep in the basket here beside me. So apologies if you hear loud snoring. So today I'm going to talk to you guys about a study I conducted um, two or three years ago uh, in relation to using public transport and the experiences people who are living with dementia have. Um, as I said, I undertook this uh, research under the supervision of my now supervisor, Dr. Louise Hopper, and it was in conjunction with the Irish Dementia Working Group and the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland. So I'd just like to start off with, with, with a quote, if I may. I think this is pertinent given that we're going to talk about PPI as well as part of this presentation. Um, as, it, as either healthcare, social care professionals or academics, we mustn't assume we know more than anyone else does. You may have to recognise that other people are experts and accept that other people have skills that will make your project work. And I think that's very pertinent, as you will see as we go through these few slides. So a little bit of background first. The Irish Dementia Working Group was established in 2013, so it's almost 10 years old. And it has grown in numbers and member capacity. So there are now Eastern, Southern and Western groups in Ireland. And members of the Southern Dementia Working Group raised the issue of using public transport for people living with dementia. The group had expressed concerns regarding the lack of public transport, fear around independence and autonomy, and in particular, the worry about what happens when a person can no longer drive as a result of dementia. So following a discussion with the Irish Dementia Working Group steering group, they decided to research this topic. Specifically, the group wanted to explore the experiences that people have when using public transport. Public patient involvement was used in this research. For those of you who may not know what public and patient involvement means, it's defined as research being carried out with or by members of the public rather than to, about or for them. And involvement means working with the public and patients throughout the research process as partners or co-producers rather than doing research on them. PPI allows for the public and patients to be involved at every stage of the research, beginning with the topic selection, study design and assisting with participant recruitment all the way through to the dis dissemination of findings. And this particular project is a perfect example of how PPI can work. So when the Irish Dementia Working Group then came up with this idea of wanting to examine um, the experiences of people living with dementia have when using public transport, they contacted the ASI and the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland then commissioned this research and funded the research. The overall aim of the research was to try and capture the experiences of members of the Irish Dementia Working Group as they made a variety of journeys on public transport with specific objectives to review the literature on the use of public transport and access for people with dementia, and then conduct a qualitative analysis of the experiences of people with dementia, the experiences that they have when using public transport. And both these factors were combined together then into a subsequent report, which included some recommendations. So today specifically, I'm gonna go through points one and two of that. So we'll look at what I did to review the literature, the findings from that, and then how we conducted the qualitative analysis and, and the findings from that. So part one then is the literature review. So we conducted a scoping literature review in order to try and identify all the existing literature in the area of dementia in relation to public transport across all elements of the travel chain. And I'll explain the travel chain in the next couple of slides. The literature shared search was carried out using a range of databases 
accessible through Web of Science, Psych Articles and Psych Info. To be eligible for inclusion, the articles had to be written in English, published in peer-reviewed medical and health, technical or social science journals, and had to address issues of cognitive impairment in relation to the use of public transport. So search terms used, for example, just some of the search term used were cognitive impairment or dementia and driving cessation or public transport. And an overview of this, how we went through this process is coming up in the following slides. So what is cognitive impairment then? Well, cognition relates to an individual's capability to acquire, store, transform and use knowledge and includes a number of mental processes that facilitate this operation as and when an individual encounters new information. An impairment in this area in cognition can stem from either an innate or acquired brain injury and may lead to a reduced capacity in the ability to acquire, store and use information. Cognitive impairment may result in significant problems with such modalities as attention, memory, planning, reasoning, spatial awareness, and speech and language or motor function. Some individuals may be impacted by all or a combination of those deficits. And these deficits can result in difficulties with remembering or trying to orientate yourself, issues with problem solving and difficulties with verbal expression. So in other words, cognitive impairment can place severe limitations on an individual's capabilities to perform basic mental and or physical tasks of daily living. One prerequisite for accessing activities outside the home is the individual's ability to move freely in their own community. So individuals who are living with a cognitive impairment may find that moving freely outside in the environment becomes significantly compromised as a result. So just to speak a little bit about the travel chain, using public transport is not a simple procedure. And in fact, it comprises many differing and often complex factors that's referred to as the travel chain. So deciding to take a journey can include varying tasks such as booking or buying the ticket. You may have to walk to a parked car, drive the car to a bus or train station or terminal. You have to wait then at this uh, station or terminal. Then you board or alight the train. You get to your final destination and you disembark. So it's not just a simple process. It involves several factors from pre-trip planning all the way to, to your destination. The research into this area of the travel chain that it can present significant challenges to even the ro most robust of individuals. So if we say typ typically developing individuals find can find accessing the travel chain dif difficult. Simple factors such as using the toilet, lack of security, comfort, delays, these all can lead to significant levels of anxiety for someone who's traveling. Research, for example, by Logan and colleagues found that people who used to drive a motor vehicle experience significant difficulties when using public transport. So these factors rarely exist in isolation. Instead, they interact in a complex way on an, individual's ba on an individual basis. Individuals cited difficulties when att attempting to obtain the necessary information before beginning their journey, issues relating to interacting with traffic and problems around communicating their intentions with the driver, and I've heard this in particular now with people using the loo is seen as the driver sort of isolated in his own little cocoon. So there is no communication with the driver. Research conducted in, in Scotland um, a few years ago, they surveyed people who were using buses to try and examine their experience of taking the bus. And they identified numerous factors that can reduce the participants' intentions to use the bus, such as feeling unsafe, preferring to walk or cycle, issues with the service, delays, etc., feeling anxious or preferring to use their car, the cost, whether the individual has some form of a disability, levels of discomfort and self-image. Such factors can pr prove to be extremely difficult for individuals living with a cognitive impairment. Stahl and Lexel recently outlined how part participants who only have minor impairments may be compromised by a number of factors while traveling by bus. For example, when faced with events that are unexpected or when too many events occur simultaneously, participants reported that the demands of the situation become significantly more complicated. So for example, if you have someone who's traveling by bus with a myocognitive impairment and maybe the bus hits traffic due to an accident or just higher levels of traffic, or if the bus has to take a detour and maybe isn't going the familiar route that they're, that they're used to, 
these can all lead to significant levels of, of anxiety. So to get back to the literature review, the, the literature review, articles were selected um, uh, during the selection process, abstracts were identified, uh, were first manually screened. So I looked at abstracts first, according to the inclusion criteria. The article had to be peer reviewed and comp comp comprise issues in relation to cognitive impairments as well as public transport. The, fu the full text of all articles retained following stage one screening when they were then examined in independently by myself. So basically, if the article didn't fit the criteria at abstract stage, it wasn't, I uh, got rid of it straight away. And then if it did, um, I reviewed the full text of the article. This resulted then in 56 relevant full text articles. And these were used in this literature review. And then as an illustration of the various disciplines that were involved in this process coming up in, in, in the next slide or two. So here's, a, here's an example of, of how I went about the literature review. So you search your initial database search, such as the Web of Science, Psych Articles and Psych Inflow. The initial database search yielded 345 um, articles. I removed a lot of duplicates out of that. 143 articles, then I reviewed the abstracts, and there was a few more removed after that. 104 full text articles were reviewed, and finally, 56 articles were included in, in, in the final re review. Um, the disciplines ranged from psychology to gerontology to geriatrics and psychiatry, and that's just outlined there in that little um, diagram. How did I analyze the data? The, the, the data was analyzed by applying an inductive qualitative, qualitative thematic analysis that used, used open-end coding and derived categories directly from the interview material. So I read the transcripts basically thoroughly line by line in order to identify meaning units. So if what's a meaning unit? So example, words or sentences or paragraphs that relate to each other or relate to the same meaning with the aim of condensing the material. Then corresponding meaning units, I grouped these together into several teams and sub-teams. And they emerged from the data and we grouped everything together, as I said, and you have so main teams and then related sub-teams. I then read and reread the transcripts to ensure that these teams were a good fit to the data. And then I pulled out participant anchor, anchor quotes to, to verify this. So what do we find from the, from the literature review? Well, many people with cognitive impairments may anticipate that they will experience difficulties with public transport even before they leave their house. For example, research conducted in Sweden, they surveyed over 800 people post-stroke. And this research showed that the majority of people had not utilized public transport after their stroke. Similar research by Wendell and colleagues, they found that up to one third of individuals living with some form of cognitive impairment reported a significant decrease or no usage of at all public transport compared to usage before the onset of the cognitive impairment. So this sense of anticipation may stem from a decreased level of self-confidence, resulting in a reduction in the use of public transport or the transport infrastructure. People who are living with dementia may also have varying degrees of cognitive impairment, ranging from mild to severe. Symptoms may include problems with short-term memory, difficulties with understanding, learning new information, and issues with the utilization and enhancement of cognitive mapping skills, which are vital factors in order to navigate our outside world or our, our outside environment. Furthermore, the presence of dementia may not only cause disorientation and memory loss, but also exacerbate the effects of physical impairment. So a lot of individuals um, living with, with dementia may have issues with their gait, with walking, with balance, as well as the, the cognitive problems. So in order to ensure that the environment does not further limit a person with dementia's mobility, appropriate environmental features and behavioral cues need to be taken into consideration to enable the person with dementia to understand what to do in a particular context and how to find our way around in the outside environment. People living with dementia may choose a variety of different ways to access this outside environment, such as walking, cycling, and utilizing various forms of public transport, such as taxis, buses, trams, trains, Lewis, etc. Or they may cho choose to drive a motor vehicle. However, driving requires a particular set of skills 
that can be adversely affected by the cognitive impairment that's associated with dementia. Therefore, many individuals who are diagnosed with dementia may face the reality of driving cessation. This reality, more often than not, is a very difficult process and has significant adverse effects, both on the person with dementia and their family, and it can result in dramatic changes to both the, respect, both the family's lifestyle and the person with dementia's lifestyle. For example, ceasing to drive may, significant, may signify a loss of independence, and it may curtail a person's flexibility to access certain leisure and social activities, resulting in an increase in the symptoms of depression and potentially earlier admission to long-term residential care. So public transport, if an individual has to cease driving due to the onset of dementia, public transport then may allow for the individual to continue their autonomous outdoor mobility and help to reduce the individual's reliance on the support of family and friends or social services, and also help the individual to remain actively and engaged in their own community. So public transport, for someone who has had to give up driving as a result of a cognitive impairment from dementia in this case, public transport may become a vital link for them to remain active members in their own community. And as social participation is increasingly used as a measure of health and well-being, the use of public transport then may become the only link to continued societal participation and a sense of independence. So it really shows the importance of public transport for an individual who has to cease, uh, cease driving for whatever reason, but in this case, individuals who've been diagnosed with, with dementia. So that, that's what we found from, from the scoping review. As I said, we looked at um, driving cessation in various cognitive forms of cognitive impairment, such as stroke, but we also looked at driving cessation from cognitive impairment that people may acquire from, from, from dementia. So the second part of this whole um, piece of research then was the qualitative analysis. So I'm just going to take you through to, uh, what we did with the, the different parts of the qualitative analysis and the findings from that. So basically what did we do? Well, to achieve the study aims, a qualitative research design was used. So this was used to combine the relevant literature that I've just gone through related to dementia and driving cessation and access access accessibility to public transport. But this bit brought in the members of the Irish Dementia Working Group and their experiences of using public transport with their diary and field notes and interview data. So there was five participants took part in the research. They were all people living with a diagnosis of dementia who were members of or are affiliated with the Irish Dementia Working Group or the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland. Their travel companions, for example, a spouse, a partner, a family, friend or carer also participated where they have supported the person with dementia to plan or make their journeys on public transport. So the way it worked was if a person with dementia usually went with a friend or family member or carer, they've done the same in this particular study also. The sample size is small, but it's consistent with similar research. For example, um, Stahl's research used, used, uh, used similar methodology when they interviewed six participants, and this generated in-depth descriptions of the participants' experiences. What materials did I use? Well, it was uh, recording material, uh, audio recording equipment, notebooks, etc., and all evaluation material, um, uh, including the recording and equipment and transcribed data and participant information was stored on password protected computer files, obviously to, uh, um, to comply with ethical considerations. So this is what we did. This is the procedure. This is getting more interesting now than the, than the whole methodology piece. Participants took one or more journeys, so they could take several journeys if they, if they wished, on public transport, and they recorded their experiences of both planning and taking these journeys. So for example, participants may have elected to record a specific journey, such as a special trip or going on holidays, or a standard typical, typical journey they make frequently, such as going to the shop, going to mass, going to a doctor's appointment or a hospital appointment, or they may have decided to combine the two. When a journey was made frequently, participants were encouraged to record their experience more than once. So participants who undertook their journeys in the normal fashion, i.e. if they typically travel alone, they did so in this case, 
or if they typically travel with a, with a, with another person, spouse, partner, care, or family friend, whatever, the same process was was followed here. So they recorded their experiences of making their journeys, and they had an option to do this. So the options were they could use an audio diary, such as a, a dictaphone or a simple voice recorder on their on their Android or mobile phone. They could write a diary or field notes, or I interviewed them for about half an hour to 45 minutes um, immediately following their journey. Or they could, we could do a combination of all three. Participants themselves selected the most comfortable method for themselves. When a participant selected audio or written diary recording, they were, were made aware that I may also wish to conduct a short interview with them just to iron out any any issues with the recording, if maybe something was a little bit muffled or whatever, or I couldn't read the handwriting, just to clarify certain points. All this data then was analyzed by uh, employing the inductive qualitative thematic analysis, the exact same analysis that I would have used for the scoping literature review. And I op used open coding to derive categories and themes from the material. And I used all the, all the narratives, so all participant narratives were used in this analysis. So here's a table just outlining some of the some of the participants. Obviously, you'll see from the asterisks is that these are not the real names. But we had, interestingly, only one female and five males. Some of the individuals still drove. Some of them do not drive anymore. We had them from different parts of, of the country, some rural areas, some sort of urban, urban areas, some kind of semi-urban. The participants ranged in age from 56 up to 80. So we had some individuals who were um, living with young onset dementia. You can see the subtypes of dementia they were diagnosed with there, young onset Alzheimer's, Lewy body dementia and Alzheimer's. And then um, the sort of public transport that they use most frequently, which is a kind of a mix of everything between train, bus, taxis and, and Lewis. And as I said, some of them still drove occasionally. So what did we find? So following the, the thematic analysis and rereading all the narratives and picking out the teams and sub teams, this is what we found. There were two overarching main teams in relation to the, whether people would or would not use public transport. There were dementia specific factors and then there were environmental factors. And some of the sub teams under dementia specific factors were things like stigma, the stage of condition or the level of the person's impairment, that sense of autonomy that someone has, or this, their sense of unease or dis discomfort. And then the environmental factors, the sub-teams underneath that main team included things like the physical environment, the rural-urban divide, whether transport was available or accessible, and then greater public awareness or lack of public awareness in some cases. And these factors then can break the travel chain at any point along its chain. So things like stigma, the availability, the sense of autonomy, the physical environment level of impairment can break this chain all the way along at any stage of, of the travel chain. Here's some participant quotations, um, some participant data. To, to highlight dementia specific factors. And I apologize in, in advance for any language that may appear in these quotes, but this is verbatim. So one individual said, yes, those people that have dementia, they don't want anyone to know, and it's a bastard for them. That's solely because of the stigma that goes with it. While another individual stated, I can read the timetable. I can work on that. I haven't reached that stage yet. While someone else said, when I was diagnosed first, I would never take the train on my own. My wife would have to go everywhere with me. But once I got used to it, the staff are more than willing to help. All you have to do is ask. Well, someone else said, I have taken the train and sometimes I have to stand. The bus is always crowded. I felt awkward. It's difficult for vulnerable people to use busy transportation. And here's some participant quotations just to highlight the environmental factors. One individual stated, there was a big crowd getting off and I didn't see the railings or the gate. I was pushed through the gate, missed the curb and fell onto the road. Someone else said, we live out in the country and our nearest town is three miles away. If I had to get a bus in the morning, I would have to get a lift three miles into town. There's no link service in the town whatsoever. While someone else said, 
it had been a very long week and I was pretty exhausted getting off the train. I had to do this bit totally on my own. A lot of people got off the train and everybody seemed to be in a hurry. While someone else said, the staff know me now. They know I have dementia and they're absolutely wonderful. So in conclusion of that part of the study, it shows that an insight into the experiences of using public transport for people with dementia. The findings have shed light on both the personal and environmental factors that can either facilitate or act as a barrier to public transport use across many elements of the travel chain. These findings demonstrate that public transport, when and where available, can be used by people with dementia to actively engage in their social environment. Many individuals with dementia do not require any assistance to navigate the various public transport systems, mainly due to the stage and severity of their condition. In other words, people who are living with a relatively mild cognitive impairment appear more able when accessing public transport. However, for many more individuals with a significant cognitive impairment, they do require assistance. And the hidden nature of dementia and the lack of public understanding or awareness acts as a barrier for these individuals. Recommendations that arise out of this report um, basically state that public transport staff and, and the general public could benefit greatly from training and educational programs that are specifically focused on recognizing the signs and understanding the effects of cognitive impairment in order to increase the knowledge about dementia. Training may also help to reduce the stigma and allow public transport staff to, to help people with cognitive impairments such as dementia, therefore making public transport hubs more dementia friendly. And then the anxiety that people with dementia may feel about using public transport could be reduced if public transport and the general public are more dementia aware. However, this must be a bio-directional relationship. It cannot be unilateral. People with dementia and public transport staff, it has to be a bio-directional between people with dementia and public transport staff in order to facilitate this sharing of knowledge in relation to the condition, in order to facilitate greater dementia awareness. The people with dementia are the experts in this field. I am not an expert and I don't know any other academics that are. People with dementia are the experts. They should be involved at every stage of any training or educational programs that transport service providers may undertake. This in turn may allow people with cognitive impairments such as dementia to disclose their condition without any fear of being stigmatized. So that, that brings to the conclusion, the end of that little piece of research. So what I'd like to do now is, um, I think I have the time, um, is just go through what I've learned as, as a researcher in the short period of time that I'm doing this. I'm only doing this sort of research for the last four or five years. As I said, I wasn't always a, an academic. But what I've learned through using um, PPI is, for example, why do we involve members of public in the research? Who do we involve and how can we involve them? So as well as the practical benefits um, of helping to ensure research quality and relevance, the underlying reasons for involving members of the public in research are also informed by broader democra democratic principles of citizenship, accountability and transparency. So they're the big reasons, I suppose, the big umbrella terms why we should include public and patients in, 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 the, in research. The reasons for involvement then, these may overlap because they're not always clearly, clearly defined. However, if we understand why we involve members of the public in research, this will help to, to understand the who and therefore the how we involve them. So for example, in this particular piece of research I've just outlined, why did those members of, of, of the Irish Dementia Working Group get involved in the research? Because they wanted to, to um, see what it was like for people with dementia using public transport. So members of the public get involved in research for a variety of personal social reasons. That was their reason. For some, it may be linked to personal experience of health or social care services and a desire to bring about change in the quality of the care or improve treatments, either for themselves or for others. For others, it may be a way of to, to have a voice and influence the processes that affect people's lives. Or it might be to influence research by giving something back and helping others through their involvement. 
Well-planned and well-resourced involvement in research can also be valuable to those involved in increasing their confidence and knowledge and helping them to develop new skills. Involving members of the public may also provide a different perspective. Members of the public might have personal knowledge and experience of your research topic or be able to provide a more general perspective. Even if you are an expert in your field, and I don't like to use that term because I am by no means an expert in my field, my knowledge and experience was greatly was greatly differ, differ to the experience of someone else, and that piece of research has just outlined that, who is using a particular service or living with a health condition. Um, individuals and members of the public um, can help improve the research quality. So for that piece of research I've just outlined, members of the Irish Dementia Working Group were involved at the initial conception stage. So they conceived this piece of research and therefore it was their idea and they were involved at every step of the way of how we were going to go about and implement this piece of research. So therefore they helped to, help to improve the research um, quality. So for example, they were able to tell me to make the language and content of information more appropriate or more accessible. So for example, in questionnaires or patient and participant information leaflets or consent forms, for example, they made me understand that I had to make all these inf uh, leaflets more uh, dementia friendly. They may help to ensure that the methods proposed for the study are acceptable and sensitive to certain situations for potential research participants. They can help to ensure that the research uses outcomes that are important to the public. And they can help to increase participation through research. And as a researcher, this is very important to, because we're always struggling to, to find participants. So anything that can help a researcher to increase participation is of vital importance. So in making the research more appropriate and acceptable to pot potential participants, by improving the information provided so people can make informed choices, and by also uh, helping to include seldom heard groups or minority groups, it all helps to increase research participation. And then it can help to um, improve research relevance. So for example, through the identification of a wider set of research topics that have helped the social care professionals have worked alone. So if I had worked alone on that piece of research, it may not be as relevant or ecologically valid, to use a, a psychological term, um, to the general public as way more relevant for the fact that it was people with living with dementia who co-designed this and um, were with me every step of the way. Through the, um, it can help to, to make, make the research more relevant through the suggestion of ideas for new research areas or to ens ensuring the research is focused on the public's interests and concerns and that money and resources are used efficiently. And it can also make research more relevant in assisting to reshape and clarify the research. So we would have revisited this topic over and over again before we even the research was commissioned. We went back to it and redefined it and adjusted exactly what, what we wanted to do. And as I started with a quote, I'd like to finish with a quote. And I think this is particularly apt, again, given the, the topic we're talking about and PPI and trying to engage people in research. No matter how complicated the research or how brilliant the researcher, patient and the public always offer unique and valuable insights. Their advice when designing, implementing, and evaluating research invariably makes studies more effective, more credible, and often more cost efficient as well. So I think that quote is, is really, really speaks to the, to the research I've just outlined. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and open the floor to any questions. That was uh, that was excellent, Carl. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I do have a few questions myself, but I'll open up to the floor beforehand uh, as a good host as I'm trying to be. So would anyone like to ask a question or if you would rather put the question in the chat box, uh, you, you may do the so. You may do that as well. Hi, Carl. Um, 
I, I, that was really interesting. Thank you very much. I'm just wondering in terms of the future of this study, you know, has there been engagement maybe with um, either public transport providers or designers to see how this might um, help people with dementia going forward? And then just I suppose a second but related question. You did talk about appropriate environmental features and behavioural cues. And I'm just wondering, is that something that maybe goes more to the design aspect of public transport? And, and is, is there any kind of guidance around that? I'd be interested to hear. Thank you. Thanks a million, uh, Adele. Brilliant, brilliant, uh, two brilliant questions. So firstly, uh, in relation to the first part of your question, um, this little little research project is part, was part of a bigger research project and it actually has made a difference with um, Irish Rail have got involved and they are attempting to make um, their trains, trams, DART more dementia friendly. They're also, I was at the Engage in Dementia conference yesterday and funny, they're actually... Um, the National Dementia Office at the moment are designing a, I suppose, a sticker or a badge, maybe that, that I suppose, for want of a better way of explaining it, that um, anybody who's going to get involved in making their, uh, whether it's a public transport or a shop or supermarket, more dementia friendly, they can display this symbol at the door on the outside of the building so that people who are living with dementia are aware that when they enter this particular premises or enter this particular wherever it is, is is um, more dementia friendly or the people and staff are aware that people with dementia may use their, their, their services. Um, in relation to the second part of your question, make, d d trying to improve the environment is tricky, very, very tricky. So I suppose if I use the comparison of some um, uh, long-term care facilities, particularly the dementia units of long-term care facilities. They tend to use different color coding patterns. They'll tend to use different, um, they'll make sure that the floor is a different color from the wall. They'll make sure that handrails are clearly visible, things like that, even right down to the to the, to the plates people are, are eating their dinner off. There won't be too florally patterns or kind of plain, that sort of stuff. So th that's the sort of area where, where the, I suppose the built environment can 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 be made better for people living with the, not just with dementia but with other cognitive and cognitive impairments as well. Now, how you go about doing that in the environment and where you get the money from, <laughs> that's above my pay grade. But that's the sort of thing that 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 the research would have shown that people with living with dementia can navigate their environment a lot more easily if things are clearly outlined which is, as I said, easier said than done. It's much more easier to do that in a care setting than it is obviously in a in a busy train station like Bazaars or somewhere or Houston station. But that's the sort of thing. Does that answer your your question? Question? Yeah, thanks, Carl. I was actually kind of linking it to that idea of, um, I suppose, inclusion by design, which we would see quite a bit on, on the disability, the broader disability uh, side of design. So I, I am in a, a public transport background. So yeah. some of my colleagues would be dealing with the design side of this. Yeah. So I'm very interested to know just, you know, is there engagement that's going to sort of help to bring this into the design aspect? Because I think if you can get designers familiar with the issues, you have a much better chance of a, a long term sort of sustainable environment for people. <laughs> Exactly. Dementia. Exactly. If you get if you get the environment at the initial stage, you know, I know like then obviously there's a whole there's a whole like let's be honest, there's a whole financial cost to all of this as well. Um it's all very well, you know, at the initial stage of designing a new building to to, to make it dementia friendly. But if you're trying to reform all the existing infrastructure we have, that's a totally different scenario. But I will I have to say Irish Rail have been fantastic so far. From what I hear, they're they're doing trying to do fantastic work. And I, I think if the National Dementia Office go ahead, now they didn't unveil, unfortunately, their symbol yesterday. They kind of kept everybody in suspense. They said they're working on their new emblem. Um, w when they bring that forward and, and if more organisations and more institutions can then display that, albeit maybe staff will have to get some form of training to be, as I said, the dementia aware. You know, I'll just give you an example. There was one lady spoke yesterday where um, she went into a, into her into her local. No, she was on holidays in some area of Ireland. She went into the shop, and on her way in, she saw the sticker on the door that said, "This premise is dementia friendly." And she actually asked for the manager because she wanted to shake his hand. And the manager told her, "He said they got somebody from um, the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland just to talk to the staff to make them more aware that what an individual with and there's different stages of dementia, obviously, as you know." 
So what, what he said his staff members do is they, if, if an individual comes in and, and they can spot the signs, they're not rushing over to help. They only will offer help if the person requires assistance. So, you know, it's there's a fine line because if, if you rush over to help, then you have the whole stigma and people feel you know, that you're kind of undoing the sense of autonomy. So it is a, a tricky situation, but that's just one example of where, where it what seems to work really, really well. Really interesting. Thanks, Carl. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, we have uh, the hand up from Emer. If you'd like to go ahead, Emer. Um, hello, Cahill. Um, very interesting. Um, I I'm wondering. Um, did you engage with the carers much? Um, so it's kind of weird to you know say dementia. One of the issues is memory, but so they're keeping their diary of of what their memory of it is, and their memory of something mightn't be the actual reality of what happened or didn't happen or whatever and i'm wondering did you take into consideration the opinions or anything from the carers yeah very good question Eamon. thank you i did of course yeah as i said um most of the people who were part of this study would have had their carers with them as the, as they travel in public transport there was very few that actually undertook the journeys on their own so the carers would have also been keeping their little diaries and, and, and their field notes. And that was the reason for um the, the both interviews, both the longer interview and then the, the shorter interview, just to kind of clarify anything. So like there was a lot of the some of the audio recordings were quite muffled, as you can understand, maybe on a busy train or a busy bus. So I was able then to go to ask the to to the carer, you know, it did this actually happen the way that it's been portrayed? And uh, more often than not, the, the individuals who were living with dementia, everything was was uh, was a hundred percent. But I did engage with 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 their carers, whether it be a spouse, a partner, a child, friend, whatever. And and if I may ask a second question, um, Luke, um, <clears throat> you said this was a study that you did a few years ago or recently. I'm curious as to what you're doing for the actual PhD you're doing at the moment. <laughs> Are you continuing with the same work in dementia? Yeah, the, the, that study was was. Um, I'll tell you when it was done. It was done in 20, 2019. Geez, the COVID now and every year. I think it was either 2019 or 2020. 2019 or 2020. Mm -hmm. So as part of my um, undergraduate degree, my final year project, talking about carers, would have um, I would have interviewed carers of people which living with young onset dementia, and I used that final year project, which sub subsequently was published. I was delighted to say, as a sort of a stepping stone into the PhD. In other words, as an undergraduate student, there's, there's a lot of things you can't do ethically you know you can't work with a vulnerable, vulnerable population for example so hence working with carers but when when you come out from under the undergraduate um uh, the undergraduate umbrella and you're then a phd student um i won't say all the shackles are off you still have to jump through a lot of ethical ethical hoop, hoops as as stella would would attest to but you're allowed to work then with, with, with a more vulnerable population. So, for example, children who are under 18. So um, with young onset dementia, a lot, of, a lot of people would be parents. And a current study I've just completed was interviews with their children to see what their experiences were. And then people with, with young onset dementia themselves. In fact, um, one of the first studies I undertook as part of a PhD would have been using PPI where I ran focus groups with people living with young onset dementia to try and get a, a, a handle on what um, they wanted to be examined, what questions they wanted to, to, to be asked. And that led to a to a subsequent study. And then I'm currently working with the with the, with the children as well. Okay. Thank you very much. All very Thank interesting. You. Thank you. Wonderful. I might actually just pop in with a question here um, before we finish. I was just wondering in terms of um, it, it could possibly be propped up in your literature review or maybe even discussions after you came to the close of this research. Um, was there any policies or measures done in different countries around the world uh, to help people with dementia or other maybe uh, kinds of um, uh, issues? Uh, on things that come to mind now, which I'm thinking of uh, in the London Underground, they have a badge system, which I believe grew out of people uh, who were pregnant to to make sure they got a seat. And uh, it doesn't say 
what their issue is. I think the pregnancy one does say this person is pregnant, but I think people with uh, disabilities or other issues who may need a seat or just uh, a little bit of extra care, I, I believe there's, it doesn't say what they are, but everyone knows that that badge signals that they may or need some extra time or some extra service. So I was wondering, a, have you seen anything similar to this or just anything interesting? Well, I know in our own, in our own country, um, they have what's known as a jam badge. Just a minute. I don't know if you've come across anybody with one of those badges, but people who, again, living with dementia or maybe um, have survived a stroke, for example, you know, or some other form of, of cognitive impairment. So they wear this jam badge that so staff members will know, you know, just give me, I just may, may need a minute to take my time. So that that's currently um, in our own country. But... I suppose we are a little bit behind when it comes to if we're focusing now specifically on, on, on dementia. Um, the UK, uh, are, are particularly in Scotland, do a hell of a lot of work for, for dementia, in particular young onset. And then the Netherlands are, are unbelievable with, with young onset dementia. There's a hell of a lot of work um, centered around Maastricht University. I was recently at the Alzheimer's Europe Conference, so a lot of would have spoken to a lot of colleagues um, uh, the, the, the Netherlands seem to be way ahead of the curve when it comes to dementia in general but specifically the area I'm interested in young onset but as I said in our own country you, you have got that uh, just a minute badge but what I have found Luke over the over the last couple of years I've been doing this a lot of people living with dementia who are maybe mildly cognitive impaired so they're not at the later stages of, of, of the condition they may not want to wear that badge for because they feel that it might bring undue attention. There's a whole stigma that goes around. See, we still have a massive stigma around dementia in this in this country, particularly young onset, because dementia is is viewed the stereotypical view of dementia is a, is is of an older person's disease. So if you Google dementia, you're going to get pictures of people in their seventies and eighties, and you know, with young onset, there, there seems to be a particular stigma around, you know, having this condition. Um, one of the most prevalent subtypes of young onset is a subtype known as behavioural variant frontal temporal dementia, so it affects the frontal lobes of the brain. So it's got nothing to do with memory that would this, people with Alzheimer's would have. It affects people's behaviour. So if you have someone who is maybe, you know, their personality has changed or maybe abusive or aggressive, you know, or using foul language. Like a lot of these people are, are not even being diagnosed with dementia because of their age. They're being diagnosed with bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. So even trying to get a diagnosis is, is difficult. But in answer to you, that's going off track there a little bit. In answer to your question, yes, there is, we, we are getting better in Ireland. There is that just a minute um, badge but other countries seem to do it a lot, a lot better. I, I don't know. I wouldn't know too much about Greece now. Maybe Stella may maybe a little bit more more, more about our home country. But I know for sure the Netherlands they they seem to be brilliant at it. In so many ways, we are far behind. I I won't start with it, but okay, uh, okay. yeah, I I I just say we are far behind. We are. Uh, there are definitely signs of progress in the last few years, but uh, aspects that relate to stigma and um, access mm -hmm. to numerous facilities, not just transport, but even different types of facilities and buildings, is um, we are far behind. Unfortunately, it's very disappointing, but that's how it is. I think stigma is one of the biggest issues that, that people face. So, for example, one like I, I chose a couple of quotes for that presentation, but like I could have chose a, a myriad of quotes. It was one gentleman that was part of the, it, 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 just to give you an example of the study, um, one of the journeys he took, he got onto his, his local bus, and the driver knows him, but this particular day there was a different driver, and he got on the bus, and the driver threw him off and be drunk he was fumbling in his pockets for his change and stuff and he, you know so that's the sort of stuff that 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 you know they have to that 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 unfortunately that the, these these individuals have to face whereas when when it's when it was his own driver and the the, the man knew who he was and knew the issues and stuff there's no there's, there's there's no problem so there's where that just a minute badge comes in 
if he was wearing just a minute badge, the new driver may have seen the badge and realized that well, I need to give this person a minute. Something, some, it's obviously something wrong. But the, the stigma is, is unbelievable. And his, his wife recounted the story that she was standing at the front door, watched him getting onto the bus. The bus pulled off. 100 yards down, down the road, the bus stopped and he got thrown off. So, like, you know, I don't know how you go about... It's education and awareness. It has to be. That's how you counteract that. You know, that is, that, that, that's, that's an awful story. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, you want to say something? Yes, and no, I, I don't have any questions at this point, but I just wanted to say thank you to, to Karhal for a very beautiful, very interesting talk on your uh, quite recent research, really. And just add, uh, just ask actually something uh, uh, kind of a bit, a bit more general. Would you consider the, uh, the effort of the focus groups and the input from the public, which in this case is a particular population, as um, what we would call in the past in the preparatory phase of a proposal, a pilot, you know, like um, almost like running a pilot study when you are getting information from them in an effort yeah. to see, for example, if your wording is correct, if it yeah. satisfies their needs, if they can understand it, or aspects that relate, you know, to how you can run, how you can ultimately uh, launch your research. Uh, would that be some some aspect of a pilot study? Yeah, I suppose, I suppose you could you could look at it that way. That when it, when it, specifically when it comes to um, as you say, like I, I could I could compose a questionnaire and then I'll give the questionnaire back to the focus group and then they'll go, oh, no, you can't use this term, you can't use that term. For example, the language needs to be changed, this question shouldn't be here, it should be there, whatever. So yeah, I suppose it's kind of like giving a little pilot study first to this small group before it goes out to the to the wider group. Um, but that, that's where the 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 focus groups like that are, I think, are essential because you know. As I said, the word expert, I'm no expert on this and, and I don't know how many years you'd need to be to be an expert, but the person who's living with the condition, they're the real expert, wherever the health condition is. Um, so like having a focus group to be able to run things by, as you say, like in a sort of a pilot study, it really is it's crucial because we, we, we miss things. We're trying to, we're trying, as researchers, you know, if you're if you're rushing to meet an ethics deadline and you're trying to get stuff done, you, there's stuff you're going to miss. And having having the 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 pilot group or the focus group to sort of run stuff by, I think I think is crucial. Yeah. So I, and, yeah, you could call it sort of a little pilot study first. Yeah. And this matches perfectly with the last comment I had in regards to the recommendations you had put at the end of your presentation. I found them so incredibly useful and you know thought provoking for all of us. Uh, it's very, very nice. It's kind of a summary with the impact mm -hmm. coming out of it as well, not only for you as a researcher, but for uh, for any one of us in the audience or for, for anybody, really. Things to take into account uh, as it relates to running a research study with a particular population. So thank you so much, Kahal, really. A very nice presentation. Thank you. Yes, I'm going to reiterate uh, Stella's sentiment. Uh, thanks a million, Carl. That was truly excellent. Um, I see people are kind of logging off because people have to get to other lectures and things like that. It's just the way it goes. But uh, on behalf of the centre, um, thank you. It was an excellent way to finish off the lecture series. Well, thank you, Lou. Thank, thanks for inviting me. I really, really enjoyed it. Thanks And thank you for organising it as part of Science Week. Look, thank you so much. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Have a good day.